Thank you, Lord. Praise you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Holy Spirit, have your way. Holy Spirit, breathe on this congregation. Breathe your power. Holy Spirit, breathe on us. Holy Spirit, breathe on us. <clears throat> We've been studying prayer. The first Thursday of the month, We've been looking at prayer since the first of the year. Uh, January, we looked at the Father to the Son, the Son to the Father, and saw that as a child comes to the Father when they're born into a family, that's the way we are to come to God. We're supposed to be able to sit next to God and, and talk to Him, commune with Him, have conversation. And who doesn't like to talk if you're a woman? <laughs> and then in February, we're, we were seeing uh, Jesus as the prophet and also as a prayer warrior. Because if you go through there, you will see what he prayed for uh, his disciples to become apostles. Jesus was a prayer warrior. Uh, it tells in uh, chapter 17 of John, it's the longest prayer in the Bible, and Jesus prayed it for his apostles so that they would go out and touch lives, and for us at one point, to go out and touch lives, to change lives, to see the world impacted. And so uh, when we did the study, we noticed that everything we've been following had to do with humility. We have to be humble before God. And Jesus was showing us two governments. There's the, the natural of what there was with King Herod and the Roman uh, Empire, that government. And then Jesus broke through the crowd and went into the temple and overturned the tables. That was the spiritual. That was his house was to be a house of prayer. And so we're looking at two governments. We start tonight with Jeremiah 6. And it's verses 16 through 20. Thus says the Lord, stand in the ways and ask for the old paths where the good way is and walk in it. And you will find rest for your souls, but they said we will not walk in it. This is the prophet Jeremiah talking to the people that God has sent them this message and they're saying we're not going to walk in it. But yet God was leading them to seek the old paths. What was laid down from the foundation of the world, that's the path you're supposed to take. In 17, verse 17 of Jeremiah 6, it says this. He says, also I set watchmen over you. I set people to pray over you. And I, I want you to listen to the sound of the trumpet. But they said, we will not listen. And so he was telling them, I want you to listen to the prophet when they're giving you this warning. You need to know that if there's a warning going out, he has to tell you because he's standing his watch. He's keeping watch over that community, over the city, over that area, you know, where God wants you to be protected. But they're saying we will not, we're not going to listen. We're just going to do our own thing. Verse 18 says this, Therefore you nations know, O congregation, what is among them. So he's saying in verse 19, Hear, O earth, behold, I will certainly bring calamity on this people. Now he's calling his people, O earth. He's not even referring to them now as the Jew, as the Hebrew. It's now, O earth. So now it's like, okay, you want to kick around in the dust. I think of Linus walking around in the Peanuts characters. I mean, there's snow on the ground, and the kid is still kicking up dust. He's got his blankie, and he's walking around, and I'm seeing the people of this nation doing that. Right. Like dust just being kicked up all over the place. And so it says here, The fruit of their thoughts, because they have not heeded my words, nor my law, but rejected it. In verse 20, we get to what he was talking about. The, the object of what God was saying about this is why you need to be listening. 
For what purpose to me comes frankincense from Sheba and sweet cane from a far country? Your burnt offerings are not acceptable, nor your sacrifice is sweet to me. So these people were traveling all over the world and the farthest countries to bring back the sweet cane. They were bringing things over and then they're just like presenting it to God. Their sweet cane. Here, God. It cost them nothing. They just went to get it. Somebody else went and took care of it. They saw it. So, oh, here, God, you would like this. Did they ask God if they liked it, if that pleased him? I don't think so. Because he's saying here in 20, verse 20, your burnt offerings are not acceptable, nor your sacrifice is sweet to me. He was wanting a humbled heart. So now we go into Genesis and we're going to find out what that humbled heart looks like. People who walk in faith. Genesis 22, we're talking about Abraham. In verse 1 of chapter 22, it says this. Now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. And he said, take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, I will tell you. Okay, he's got a son. God is saying, go sacrifice your son, your only son. And most of us would be in panic, right? This was, you know, thousands of years ago. And yet... He told him on the Mount of Moriah, and I'm going to take you back to Mount Moriah in six verses, just seven chapters before in chapter 15. It says this in Genesis. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield. I am your exceedingly great reward. But Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me, seeing I go childless? and an heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abraham is still talking. He's not even waiting for God to answer. He's still talking, and then Abraham says this. Look, you've given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. And he says, and behold, this is the Lord cutting in now. The Lord's cutting in and saying, and behold, listen, listen. The word of the Lord said, This one shall not be your heir, but the one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. Then he brought him outside, and he said, Now look towards heaven. We have to go outside sometimes and get away from the, the crowd, and we need to go outside and look what God placed in the sky. And he told Abram, he says, Look at the stars and number them if you can. I remember being a youth and going outside in the summer. It was like, you know, 10 o'clock at night, and I loved laying on a quilt and looking up at the stars and trying to number them. It's impossible. But, but the Lord was telling him, he says, so shall your descendants be. And then it says, he believed in the Lord, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. He believed. So now he's been told, you have to go sacrifice your son. And yet on this promise from chapter 15, he says, your, your descendants are going to be like the stars in the sky. You cannot, you cannot number them. So it doesn't say that Abraham panicked. It didn't say he threw a fit, took the chair and threw it across the room because he was mad. No, he didn't do any of that. The next verse says, in verse 3 says, Abraham got up early. So see, he didn't have a pity party. He didn't lay in bed and shut the door and close the blinds, you know, to be upset. Anybody ever done that besides me? You know? Seriously. But Abraham rose early in the morning. He saddled his donkey and he took two of the people with him, two young men. And Isaac, his son, he split the wood 
for the burnt offering. He rose and went to the place which God told him, Moriah, Mount Moriah, where that first promise, that first promise of hope that he was going to have descendants came. Now he's going back to Moriah and he's supposed to sacrifice his son. But watch this. Abraham does this. On the third day, now that's just, this is now four days. It doesn't say he's having a pity party. He didn't go on Facebook to find out how many is going to follow him in this pity party. Right? Because it doesn't say that here. On this third day, he lifts his eyes. He goes to the place that he's supposed to go. He tells these two young men, stay here with the donkey, and the lad and I will go yonder, and we're going to worship, and we will come back to you. Now, that's faith speaking. He was saying, we're going to go over there and worship together, me and my son, but we're going to come back to you. And that's what he's speaking. That's what he's believing. That's what he was, because God told him. Now, if God has given you a promise, then you need to hold on to it. What he gave you from the beginning, when you were first saved, what God has said. Has God not said it and will he not do it? I can show you that one too, and he will. Amen. Verse 6 says this, So Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering, laid it on Isaac, his son. Now it's interesting. This is some 25 years from the time he got the promise. His son Isaac is about, about 6 or 7 years old, and he's helping to go to the altar to worship God. He's just not coming in. He's going to assist in the worship of God. And they said he was about six or seven years old. And it says here that he took the fire in the hand and the knife, and the two of them went, went together. But as they're going up, his son Isaac asks, My father, and he said, Here I am, my son. And he said, Look at the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? So see, he had done this so much, it's kind of, I kind of like the thought of Quinn. Dad, you're not doing that right. That is not how you do that. That is not the order. When you're used to seeing something done, and this Isaac had seen his dad do the sacrifice, he knew he was supposed to have that sacrifice. That lamb was already supposed to be available. And so he's talking to his dad, and his, his, uh, the father turns to him, Abraham, and he says, My son, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering. So the two of them went together. It's worshiping. It's prayer. It's coming together as a family together to worship God. Now stay with me. Verse 9, Then they came to the place of which God had told them, and Abraham built an altar. And he placed the wood in order. Always remember whatever you do, God does things in order. That's right. He's always going to do things in order. Right. He's not going to put the cart before the horse. He's not going to make you go before it's time. When, Julie, when it's time for you to be at work, you're going to be at work. Everything's going to fall in place. Don't fret the big, you know, that little icky stuff. Because right. God has a plan. And it says that uh, he got to that place, he bound his son, put the wood up there, placed his son on the wood. And then the angel of the Lord, and of course, of course the angel of the Lord is Jesus. Anytime you read that in the Old Testament, the angel of the Lord is Jesus. That's why we need to read the Old Testament, because it talks of Jesus. He was very much on the scene with this because of the faith. Jesus showed up when there was faith. Amen. And he says, Abraham, Abraham, and Abraham said, here I am. And he says, do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God and you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. So is there anything that we might be holding on to, oh, I don't know, too tightly that we need to lay on the altar? Are we, you know, doing church or something that's not our church, but we need to lay it on the altar? 
Is there something that we're holding on to, say, in business? Because if it's ours, it'll come back to us. Right? right? Because sometimes we're just wanting to, with our mind, will, and emotions, that's mine. It's mine. It's mine. No, actually, it's God's. Amen. Because when God gets you to a place, it's going to be yours, and nobody's going to move you out of it. If he's got a job for you, and we know he's got a good place for you, no man's going to be able to move you out of it. When God gets you in a place, they're going to need military people to move you out, and they still won't be able to touch you. Thank you. Verse 13. Then Abraham lifted his eyes, and he looked, and there behind him was the ram, this big ram caught in the thicket, and, and its horns were hung in that thicket of brush. And Abraham went, he took the ram, he offered it to the bur you know, for the burnt offering, and this is what Abraham called the place, the, the, this altar on Mount Moriah where the promise came. This is what he said. The Lord will provide. In the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. It's an altar. It's an altar. In the mount of the Lord. That stood off the page to me and I had to go start looking. This was about, about eight weeks ago. I had to go like start reading over the Mount of the Lord and about the altar and the prayer and the worship and how you come together as a family to do it. And so on verses 15 through 19, the angel of the Lord Jesus told Abraham this. He came and spoke from heaven a second time and he said this. By myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son. Blessing I will bless you. Multiplying I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven. And then Jesus goes as far to say this, and sand which is on the seashore, you will not be able to number your descendants. It's going to be the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. Jesus added that. Jesus saw his faith. And then, and I love this part, your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. When we come and worship God as a family, not just mom or not just dad, because they say the women are the prayer women. God's answering women's prayers right now for the youth. We're hearing it all everywhere we go, everywhere we go. Ron and I are going and we're hearing this. God is answering prayers for women. We heard a prayer that she has for her grandson. Prayer is being answered for the youth. God is doing these things. And it says here, In your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. So Abraham returned to his young men. They arose and went together and then went to Beersheba. Now that Beersheba, when you look at it and, and look at the word study on it, Beersheba is a place of companionship. God brought that family to abide in companionship with other people that are like-minded. And the companionship that he had with God. He was putting him in a protective place. I wish we had like weeks on this one. So as I'm looking, I'm looking at in the mount of the Lord, and it's like, okay, this is worship, in the mount of the Lord. And I started doing a word study again, and I'm going through, and it's like, and my, the, the, the Bible study thing that I have is, seems kind of lame now, but it, actually this was where I found the information. And as I started pulling things up and, and pulling it up and reading the concordance and reading the Strong's and reading this Hebrew-Greek thing, and then... All of a sudden, there, there came up on the page before me, and it says, the mount of the Lord is the table of the Lord. And who just read about the table of the Lord in Psalm 23? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. We're not going to set up a tent. We're going to keep on moving. Right. It doesn't matter what's going on. Let's keep moving. Right. I'll help you pack it up, but let's keep moving. Amen. Right? right? 
And it says that he, pre he prepares a table before us in the presence of our enemies. And Jesus talked about that in this, that he said he would have a gate for all of the descendants that came to worship of Abraham, all that came, there would be a gate. No enemies can come against you. Amen. And so when I was looking at all this, it says in Malachi 1 and 7 through 8, and this is really awesome, I was so excited and I, and I spent like days on this one. We're still talking about humility. We're wanting God to hear our prayers. You know, we just don't want to, you know, throw a Kleenex down. Here's a few of my tears. Here's, and throw it down. This is, this is my effort. I got to give you five minutes because I got to go over here. Where's my cell phone? Where's, you know, I got to touch base with, you know, Sissy Sue. Somebody might be following me on Facebook. Better go check it out. No, I want, I want to be hooked up with Jesus, with the Holy Spirit. Listen to this, what God says. Now remember Malachi, when we're talking about the very first chapter in Malachi. There was silence after Malachi was written. It was silent for 400 years before Jesus came. The sacrifice. You offer defiled food on my altar. And then the priests are saying this. In what way have we defiled your food? They're telling God this. Because this is the, these are the prophets that are sent to the priest that are offering the sacrifice to put on the altar. And these people are telling God, we don't want to do this anymore. We don't want to do sacrifices. If they had received the Ten Commandments in the, in the desert, when he brought the Ten Commandments down, all they had to do was kneel before God and say, we humble ourselves. They wouldn't have had to wandered out there for 40 years. He wouldn't have had all these ceremonial regulations and all these things to do in the burnt offering, but they didn't want to do it because, gee, we don't want to do it and we don't want to listen. There's a lot of people that are doing that today. And the Lord, they're saying this about the table of the Lord is contemptible. Now that contemptible is kind of interesting. And we don't scorn anything of God. We are supposed to come to the altar. Understand that we have to ask him what pleases him. Not to put what's pleasing us. Like, you know, sweet cane or whatever from Sheba. What pleases God? Because, you know, we might just be happy where we're at with our worship. And when you offer blind as a sacrifice, or is it evil? And when you offer the lame and the sick, is it not evil? Offer it then to your governor. She brought something tonight that she could offer the governor. My husband helped me with Quinn. Quinn she always comes and she wants to sit at that. Uh, and I could say it's for you, but it's actually for him. Because he's bringing the ones that's going to eat at it. I'm worshiping him. My husband worships him. So we set the table. What did we bring to the Lord? Randy brought his music. Randy brought her voice. My husband did shopping all week. Candace has ordered pizza. See? It's, it's bringing something to the Lord. Could you take it to your governor? What you brought to worship God? Cause, because God set the grapes. <laughs> because God, God says this. He says, would he be pleased with you? Would he accept you favorably? This is the Lord of hosts. This is God of all gods. Lord of all lords. 
Romans 12, 1 and 2, it says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Oh, my goodness, he's talking about us. We're supposed to be a living sacrifice. Hmm. So we did, did we grease ourselves with Crisco so we could just kind of slide off the altar? <laughs> Got to put a little grease on because I don't want to spend too much time so I can just slide off. This is, the, this is the look I saw, you know, somebody sliding off because I really, I got to get this message out. I got to text. I got to write somebody. Somebody has to hear from me today. And actually, the only one who really needs to hear is the one who's more important, right? And it says here, a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service, and that reasonable service is not according to the little flesh creature. That reasonable service is according to the word of God. But I have to go speak. It has to be words God, you know, the, the word of God. I have to go pray, but it should be according to God's plan. It's like the people that Julie's going to go touch. It has to be to God's plan, right? Brandy to, to minister, Kyle to make a difference, pray before you have your meetings, right? And then it says this, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. And we talked about this before. When we're saved, we're over here like, and it's good. But you got to go fill the tank. And Abraham had a full tank of faith. He humbled himself and he kept coming to build the altar. He kept coming. And he was taking his son that his son knew when something was wrong. Do our kids recognize when there's something wrong? No, that's just mom and dad being mom and dad. You know, or that's, that's grandparents being. No, because look at this. Julie's coming to church. Brandy's coming to church. She's bringing her kids to church. Julie's feeding people. And God looks at it and said, I'm well pleased. Now come on, Julie, you're going to have to get used to these because God loves you. God loves you. You're valued. Amen. So verse 10, verse 10 and 11 sounds like this. We're still in, in uh, Malachi 1, but we're now in verses 10 and 11. It says, Who is there among you who would shut the door so that you would not kindle fire on my altar in vain? I have no pleasure in you, says the Lord of hosts, nor will I accept an offering from your hands. But God says, I, I receive your offering. I receive your fruit. I receive your offering, Julie. I love you, Julie. And verse 11 says this, For from the rising of the sun, even to its going down, my name shall be great among the Gentiles. Oh my goodness. He's not even talking to the Jewish people anymore. It says here, verse 11, My name shall be great among the Gentiles. So God's evidently done with these people because they will not listen and they will not do what he says. They won't listen. They won't obey. And every incense shall be offered to my name a pure offering. A pure offering. For my name shall be great among the nations says the Lord. Incense. And where we find incense, it is found in Revelations 5, 7 through 8. He came and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb. Each one had a harp. I'd like to think that the harps they had are the big ones. 
because I'm trying to think if these guys are holding a smaller harp. And then it says they have these, the, they're holding these golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Well, if you're a saint of God, your prayer is in that bowl. It's incense. It's incense. Verse 12. We're going somewhere, so stay with me. Verse 12. But you profane it that you say the table of the Lord is defiled. Its fruit, its food is contemptible. And you say, oh, what a weariness. And you sneer at it. This is the Lord of hosts saying this. To sneer, to scoff is the outward appearance. It speaks as a derisive it's ridiculing another. It's combined with bitterness. You ever had anybody to like sneer at you and it's in church? Now, I remember a few times. Ridiculing another combined with bitterness. It speaks, I'm more superior to you. That's not good. And that's why God is describing these people that they're insulting another, they're not paying attention to the word, they're doing their own thing, and they're scoffing at the altar. They're scoffing. Now see, we're still talking about prayer. We're still talking about worship. And all these people had to do was to humble themselves. Now listen to this. Verse 14, of all of that, this one just stood out over all of them. Who has in his flock a male and makes a vow, but sacrifices to the Lord what is blemished? For I am a great king. Do you know what that means? I just would write, really like to, to, to house the homeless. And I'm going to do it when I have this amount of money. If you don't have it now, it's not going to happen then. I would like to do this with a million dollars. Are you doing it now? Because if it's not happening now, if you're not giving out of what you have now, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. Are we giving our best? In the mount of the Lord is the Lord's table. And his table is his sacrifice on the cross. Luke 22, verses 14 to 23. We're almost done now. We're almost done. I mean, we're at the meat of this now. We're at the meat. Luke 22 and, to, uh, um, 22 and verses 14 to 23. When the hour come and he sat down and the twelve apostles with him. Remember, one of the twelve apostles was Judas. So they're sitting down to eat. And then he says to them, With fervent desire, I've desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it's fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Now remember the kingdom of God, we come as a child. Right. Then he took the cup and he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And then he took the bread, gave thanks, he, and he broke it, and he handed it to them. And he says, take this, and remember, this is my body which is given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. And so when we come to take communion, we are supposed to remember that we come in humility and not tell God, well, that's not how Pastor so-and-so did that communion the last time. It's where we come, where we are in our heart to worship God, where we are giving to another. Amen. In verse 21, this, this verse stood out to me. It was still standing out to me today. Verse 21, Behold... Behold, the hand of my betrayer is with me on the table. Behold, this is Jesus talking. Behold, the, the hand of my betrayer is with me on the table. 
In the Greek, that behold is beware, perceive, understand, and know. Hand is a hollowness. It's a grasping. I have nothing to give you, but I'm going to grasp and, I, and just pretend like I'm just here. Just, you know, that's what that means. This is who Judas was. He was standing next to Jesus, and he was just reaching out. And his heart wasn't there. It's a hollowness. Has nothing to do uh, for God. It's not receiving like we saw in Jeremiah 6. They will not hear and they will not obey. The table is, is called traedza and it means meat. When Jesus came, there was a meat on the table. It was going to be his sacrifice. At the altar, there was going to be his meat, his sacrifice. But there was also another meat that's presented on the table. Listen, stay with me. In that with me, that with means it's 3326 Strong's Greek. It means meta. It means anyone coming in casual. I'm just coming in casual. Have you seen those people just come in and they, you know, they just sit at church. They just flop down, casual, coming casually. Now listen, and this meta is occupying or uh, this accompanying together. So it'd be like Judas was coming in and he's going to occupy this place. He's going to accompany them. And this place that Jesus is talking about is two extremes. We saw two governments. Remember last time we saw two governments. Jesus is still talking about two governments. The natural man who just comes on, me, myself, and I, we're, we've got to, you know, we got our, our, you know, emotions are ruling, me, myself, and I, or the spiritual, which is Jesus' government that's on his shoulders. Two governments. So when you put this together, this is what it sounds like. Behold, know and perceive that there's a hollowness and grasping as to deliver a hazard at your table. It is a place of two extremes. It's either receiving Jesus or acting like Judas. When you come, it has to do with communion. It's the cup of the covenant. Jesus was talking about both. He was talking about communion. He was talking about the covenant. Good. In truth, they are not listening to the word given. They are the noisy, consumed with that which gives no life. They are the easily distracted. They have the sounding of symbols clashing at every turn. At his table, at Jesus' table that he set, is the mount of the Lord, is the table of the Lord, it is his cross. It was his sacrifice. And so when we come to that altar, it starts with us giving our best because he gave us his best. Uh, it doesn't happen, it doesn't come with this hollowness or this grasping or, you know, it's just about me today. Have you ever been in church and there was, more, there was more going on out here than there was going up here at the word of God? which right here, it's more like right here going on. But I've been in services where people come in and they're ministering to someone at the back of the room. It's like, Jesus is in the house. Shouldn't we be talking to Jesus? The ministering can happen, but let's minister the word first. You have to get the word in first, right? We're not there to touch him with empty words. If we do that, we're like Judah, selling out for the 30 pieces of silver or selling out for our cell phone. You know, Randy had a good testimony this week. He told me Saturday, he just got rid of his smartphone. He says, I can't do that anymore because it's too distracting. He didn't want to be sold out for the phone. He wants to hear, and he's hearing so much clear. He's hearing so much clear. Um, you know, 
uh, you know, whether it's, it, it's a job or something, if there's something that, you know, is like distracting, then go, go ahead of time and pray. Go, you know, uh, Stephanie, you can certainly go in there and pray for your people. They don't have to know that you're praying in tongues. And cast whatever does not, should not be in there. Take authority over it. You have authority. People are going to love each other today when they come through this door. Amen. I've seen people come into banks. And no guns. We, want, we don't want to lose the meat that, Je that Jesus did. We don't want to lose the meat. We, we, want to, we don't want to come with our, our little, you know, our mind, our will, and emotions and be ruled by emotions. We, 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 we don't want to operate in the flesh. We don't want to operate in the natural. We want to stay in the spirit and understanding God's word. And I close with this in Matthew 11, 28. And it's, it's um, pretty much where we started from Jeremiah 6. In Matthew 11, 28, it says this. Jesus said this, and it's in the Amplified, so it's going to have a lot of words. But Jesus said this, Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am gentle, meek, humble, lowly in heart, and you will find rest, relief, ease, refreshment, recreation, and blessed quiet for your souls just like we read in Jeremiah 6 16 if we will ask for the old path and walk in it we will find rest for our souls it has to be the old path it has to be the places that was already put in place Jesus went on to say this for my yoke is wholesome useful good it's not harsh it's not hard sharp or pressing but comfortable it's gracious and it's pleasant. And my burden is light and easy to be borne. It's never about accommodating the flesh creature. It's always serving God full on in his power and his word by his Holy Spirit. Father, I just thank you right now for quick revelation. Breathe on them, Holy Spirit. Breathe on them, Holy Spirit. Ruach. Ruach, breathe, Holy Spirit, on them. A quick revelation. Help me, Lord. Help me, Lord. Quick revelation. In Jesus' name, amen.